Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, special extended episode where we are going to be talking about coastal fortifications, coastal defenses, and all those kind of wonderful things where you mount large amounts of explosive on your shoreline and hope that it keeps the enemy battleships well away. Um, I'm talking with uh, another YouTuber. You probably know him, and if you don't, you should. It's uh, the wonderful chat behind Military History Visualized, and uh, let's get on with the coastal defense discussions. Hello, everyone. I should add here, I'm mostly a land lover, so I, I will ask the more naive questions and hope we, we get something going. So I did a bit of reading and what for me came up are the, the words coastal defense, coastal protection, and what would be your general definition of this? So coastal defense is sort of, it's a, it's a much wider aspect than just the guns. So you've got coastal fortification, which is your sort of traditional forts and guns and uh, things that are designed to keep the enemy away from a specific target, whether that's a harbour, uh, a uh, shipyard or something like that, or maybe even just a critical uh, point along uh, your strategic interests, so something like Gibraltar or later on the Suez Canal, um, whereas coastal defence, as separate from the fortifications, coastal defence can include the fortifications, but it's going to incorporate a much larger scheme of things and at various points this could include things like block ships and then later on it would include things like torpedo boats and submarines minefields um, and that kind of stuff so you have basically a part active and a part more passive defenses so the submarine the coastal submarine would be more of an active defense yeah it's and a, a lot of it comes about because of uh, some of the strategic and tactical limitations of coastal fortifications which um, we can discuss in more detail as we as we get on to the subject so so in a way um it's kind of an area of area of denial weapon like a minefield because well the fort can't really move or most of it i mean the coastal submarine could move to a certain degree but but it's mainly about protecting a certain area and denying the enemy easy entrance or entrance at all yeah, and a, a lot of this comes about because a lot of naval infrastructure, obviously the ships are at sea, but the infrastructure support them, the armories, the manufacturing areas, the dry docks, the slipways, they're all based on land and likewise they don't move anywhere very quickly. But for the vast majority of the, uh, the time period where coastal fortifications are a thing, ships are made of wood and tar and rope and all these other wonderful burnable objects so it's fairly easy to destroy this infrastructure and a ship might take years to build kind of port infrastructure that you'd see at somewhere like um, Portsmouth or Plymouth in the UK and latterly uh, somewhere like Norfolk in uh, the United States or Hamburg in Germany that kind of infrastructure is the work of decades, if not centuries. So to have it all go up in smoke over the course of a day or two is a huge tragedy and something that could quite easily cripple a nation's war-making effort for effectively that whatever conflict they're fighting and possibly for years to come. To a certain degree, this, these fortifications and everything were also a lot focused on trade-based protection initially. Is this correct or is this a wrong assumption? It it kind of grows out of they it grows out of each other because way back when coastal fortifications start first start to be equipped with cannon and therefore you could kind of start to divorce them away from your general coastal protection against raiders and invading armies and things like this. At that time, you're still in an era where the difference between a merchant ship and a warship to a large degree is who is actually in command of it obviously you've got it even in the year of the spanish armada and shortly thereafter there is still a a considerable overlap between uh, a ship of peace and a ship of war basically amounting to the queen or the king says this is in my navy now and we're putting some more guns on it so the sources of those ships are strategically important and that is obviously the, the, the major 
commercial centers they're building exactly the same ships for exactly the same roles um, and so the initial protection is are uh, are seen in yeah commercial ports and harbors both to main, mainly to be honest to protect the national strategic interest because the sort of trade hubs that grow up in in various uh, coastal harbors are just as if not more important uh, as the more militarized infrastructure that begins to develop because whilst crippling the military infrastructure might cripple your nation's ability to make war crippling say if you'd sailed up to the port of london and burned that to the ground in the 16th 17th century that could have crippled the nation economically period for decades or centuries to come depending on how bad the damage was so the, the both areas needed protection and because both areas were kind of the same for a long time the first coastal fortifications that you see tend to protect what we today would probably see more as m more commercial dash civilian targets than the military ones so so basically the one extreme is trade-based protection and and the protection of the nation's um, commercial capabilities and the other extreme would be basically um, like what we have in Normandy, basically counter invasion function or how would this be called? Yeah, so I mean ca counter invasion fortifications didn't tend to be a thing for quite a while um, because well, nations just didn't have the economic capacity to cover their entire coastline in uh, fortifications and also the further back in time you go, the more locations there are to defend, uh, but also the slower armies move, so the more time you have to respond to them. Um, so when you're talking in the 14th, 15th centuries, um, and then going forward as as in this sort of gunpowder era, effectively you can land anywhere that isn't sort of extremely shallow beach for miles and miles and miles out to sea. At which point, how do you how do you fortify the entire coastline of France or or Britain or Spain for that matter? You can't. So they tend to focus their fortifications basically around the bits that matter, which are the cities, because at those at that kind of period, if an enemy happens to land on your coast in an undefended area, they're going to have to come after the cities in the first anyway, because they're the only bits that matter. Um, later on, obviously, ironically enough, as amphibious warfare capabilities get more and more developed, the ships obviously are also getting larger, the draft is getting deeper, and that actually limits the number of places that you can realistically pull off an amphibious landing. And obviously, as warfare gets more industrialized, it's not it, the, the army that you have to land also gets larger, which further complicates matters. So if you look at sort of way, way back, if we're talking right at the beginning of the gunpowder era in Western Europe, you have uh, the inv various invasions of France in the early 1400s. And the army is 10, 15,000 men total. And they literally just rock up in their little wooden cogs and hulks and they're off in a few days. You come to the same kind of thing of we need to invade france but in 1945 and all of a sudden you're talking about hundreds of thousands of men loads of mechanized equipment um and all the supplies inherent in that and that means that your list of candidates for for, for a, a suitable beach have narrowed down vastly and the enemy can do exactly the same calculations as you can which then makes defending specific landing sites a lot more viable because there's so many fewer of them. Also helped by the fact that guns have gotten an awful lot longer ranged, so you can cover a significantly larger area of, of beach with a single gun battery as opposed to, say, a cannon that's got maybe a maximum range of three miles, an effective range of a mile. Um, you're not. There's no way you can manufacture that many cannon in the 15th, 16th, 17th century uh, to cover all your coastline. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, basically, the Imperial Japanese Navy or Army were both basically um, for the inv Operation Olympic, the planned invasion of southern Japan, they basically noted, okay, they got every spot right they thought the, Ch the Americans would, would invade. Yeah. And, I mean, one other function for me that came up to a certain degree is 
area uh, C control or area control basically if you look at certain points but only for certain like Gibraltar where you can basically cut off the whole Mediterranean or one entrance of the Mediterranean also is this is I guess a rather uncommon function of of naval of naval fortification yeah and I mean even when you look at somewhere like Gibraltar the primary strength of the uh, the defense there is actually squadrons of ships based out of Gibraltar um, for a lot of the period. But yeah, it's, it, you've got kind of this, this, this sea control function happens when you can guarantee that the enemy has to come through certain narrow points. So Gibraltar is a good example. Uh, the Dardanelles, obviously access to the Black Sea from the Mediterranean and vice versa is another one. Dover, the Straits of Calais, kind of but it's that bit bigger um so the ability to effectively interdict that that area of sea passage with forts doesn't ever really fully materialize but it's just about on the edge enough to justify heavy guns being mounted there somewhat later in the overall era of naval warfare you have somewhere like the panama canal or the suez canal I, again sort of very narrow confined passageways where you, which are strategically important and you know that the enemy is either going to come through there or they're going to try and make sure that you can't come through there i actually have a question about gibraltar i, I read this mm -hmm. somewhere but it's never fully explained um basically in the second world war german submarines could easily go into the mediterranean or more or less easily but the could not leave. I heard it's due to the um, how is it called? The, the the currents. Yeah, the currents. Yeah, that's that's the English word. Yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, because because of the way the Atlantic and the Mediterranean work, there's a fairly, if I recall correctly, there's a fairly strong eastbound current that runs through the Straits of Gibraltar. Um, obviously, a submarine trying to uh, transit the Straits of Gibraltar on the surface is going to be killed horribly but in very short order um so they would go through submerged but up until the very last uh few generations of u-boats the underwater submerged speed of a, a u-boat is yeah. maybe yeah sort of five six knots if you're lucky which if you've got a three or four knot current behind you is fantastic because you can motor on through overnight or whatever coming back the other way <laughs> your rate of progress might be stationary or walking pace not so much yeah and the battery might run out of juice rather fast as well yeah and it's uh popping popping up on the surface under the guns of gibraltar is not a recipe for a very long-lived career yeah i can i imagine that so basically since we we got the the channel points now mm -hmm. Let's do a more chronological approach. So, yeah, you would begin in the in the gunpowder era, basically. Yeah, yeah. So the gunpowder era is when you start to see fortifications as a means of actively at assaulting enemy ships. Pre-gunpowder era, if you want to go back to the ancient era, you've got sort of catapults and ballista, and if you're really ambitious, trying to put something like a trebuchet on a tower. But realistically speaking, the rate of fire and the amount of damage caused is you can cause is relatively minimal. The accuracy is awful. The range is not fantastic at all. Um, so if the enemy's assaulting the fortification, then yeah, okay, you can shoot back. But um, in terms of general deterrence, you really have to wait till the range increase available with the gunpowder era. Initially, that is kind of just developments on the existing castle type fortifications. They just start sticking cannon on the on the walls, and 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 that is the pattern for quite a while. And then, once you get into what you might term the proper age of sail era, sort of the mid sixteen hundreds and onwards, you start to see more and more uh, fortifications being made with a specific eye to the needs of coastal defense as opposed to well it's it's a generic cannon armed fort and you start to see different materials used as well rather than rather than stone although you will still have stone you start to see um earthworks in front um quite an extensive use of brick as well because that's a much easier way to build a fort um especially when you know you're going to have to be uh, putting it back together afterwards. The sort of the changeover to cannons means that 
uh, unlike a stone fort that maybe could resist catapult shot or ballista shot and everything with minimal damage, you know if your fort engages with a cannon on armed ship, if it gets hit, you are going to have to do repairs, at which point brickwork is a lot easier to repair than sort of a, a near enough custom formed stone block. So so uh, this was so they put an emphasis on on rebuilding for the for the uh, for cha uh, for the selection of materials. Yes, so yeah, because I mean, an earth an earthwork is the easiest thing to repair, and it absorbs um, solid shot rather wonderfully. Um, so a combination of earthwork and brick also means that you don't have to rely on local materials so much, because um, obviously the what the coast is made of it could be made of granite it could be made of sandstone it could be made of limestone it could be made of anything granite is a fantastic material to build your fort out of except it's an absolute pig to actually quarry in the first place yeah. um whereas sandstone yeah you could make an entire fortress out of sandstone in a matter of months except it'll probably be eroded away by the wind and the rain and the first cannon shot that comes along and you're just left with a pile of sand Whereas, yeah, it's a brick and earthwork is a lot more consistent. Um, it's a consistent material, it's a known quantity, and you can start shaping it in interesting ways. So as you start to transit through to sort of the Napoleonic era, you you start to see staff with the classic star fort layouts um, come more and more into use. They, you see the first star forts come around in the early 1600s, but that it develops more and more um, to give better fields of fire and uh, much better use of the available cannon. I mean, this is really interesting because so many times people ask about something and most of the time, even, even for questions outside of military history, the answer is usually logistics. It's the same here to a certain degree. So, okay, we use what, what can we build easier or, or ship better and which is better for rebuilding and everything is one of the determining answers in many cases. Yeah, and, and one of the major issues with any kind of coastal fortification that it goes right back to the, the first gun-armed forts and carries all the way through to the post-World War II era is cost, because almost invariably coastal fortifications will have fewer guns than the ships that are attacking them, uh, partly because in, in terms of absolute cost value, if we go forward to bridge fleet to sort of the the, the Vic, late victorian early 1900s era because uh, it's a bit easier for people to visualize the concept of but if you have a battleship a battleship has a certain number of guns on it and those guns and turrets and all that are powered by the ship's engines just because you move that turret onto land doesn't mean that power requirement goes away. So you still have to, if you want your 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 uh, mounted guns to be able to move, if you want them to be able to move, elevate, at, uh, reload, etc., at the same rate that a a battleship that might be attacking it can, you have to provide power, and obviously you have to provide protection. And unlike a battleship which is built on a uh, in a dockyard or on a slipway you actually have to excavate out take all that material away then put in your magazines and your barbettes and your turrets if you're going with turrets or whatever so all of a sudden you're looking at well all the expensive bits of a battleship the guns the, the power supply the fire control you're putting all those into your fort the only bit you're not really putting into your fort is the hull and the hull is the cheapest part of any warship really at which point the question arises, well, if we're effectively building possibly at slightly more expense than if we were building a seagoing battleship, we're effectively building a land-based battleship, you now have the additional problem of, well, that can't move. A sea-based battleship can. So the, there's more utility then in just saying, well, we'll spend the money on a battleship instead, because a battleship can defend the port just as well, but it can also go out and conduct offensive operations, or it can defend another port. Um, and obviously, if the enemy puts all his money into battleships, he shows up off the coast with a dozen battleships. You have a battleship equivalent fort. You're outnumbered 12 to 1. It's still not going to end well for you. So, and even going back to the cannon era, you look at a, a, a large ship of the line with anything between 70 and 120 cannon, you'll be very hard pressed to find any kind of coastal fortification that mounted over 100 cannon 
because it, it, for the same reason, the cannon are the most expensive part of the ship. Why would you put a ship of the line's worth of guns in one location when you can just build a ship of the line and have it go to multiple locations? So I think the overall point I'm trying to get at there is that in almost all cases, a coastal fortification will be armed with fewer guns than the enemy that's coming against them. So you have to make the most economic use of those guns, the most effective use of those guns, and you have to try and keep those guns in play for as long as possible. But that then obviously still runs into the same issue of, well, the best way to do that is to put them in turrets, but that's expensive. Um, so you see a lot of guns, uh, they are either just mounted fixed in cannon walls or they will be put in uh, concrete casements or they will uh, later on have this kind of disappearing mount where the idea was so they could pop up fire and then the gun could be hidden behind a very large earthwork or something like that. But there is, there's always that inherent problem with coastal fortifications of unless you can actually justify for spending as much, if not more money than you would on a capital warship, in all other circumstances, your fortification is probably going to be heavily outgunned by the ships that it's coming against. So you have to start thinking about innovative and economic ways of increasing the effectiveness of your individual guns in a way that you perhaps don't have to uh, if you are just sticking them on a, on a warship. It's very interesting. And I, I never suspected that, that fortifications would be that expensive, but yeah, it makes completely sense. You have to put in nearly everything you put in a capital ship. It's quite insane, actually. Yeah, and if you don't, it's like you you can do it cheaper, but then your guns are a lot more vulnerable. Uh, at which point, you've still spent a lot of money on the guns, but if they get knocked out three salvos in, yeah. that was a, a waste. Speaking of this, when we take a ship off the line, the in the age of sail, the main the main problem was attacking a fortification due to it was dependent on the wind situation. So this is basically. It was mostly uh, the forts, I assume, acted mostly as a deterrent in this way, that is it worth the risk to lose a, a ship of the line? Yeah, the, the one thing that forts had over ships of the line was that, for understandable reasons, if you're on a ship that's full of tar, gunpowder, rope and wood, you do not want a fire on board your ship if you can at all avoid it. So the general tendency for most of the uh, Age of Sail era was ships would not have any fire on board, even the cooking fires, when they went into action, so they would just fire solid shot. The one advantage a fort has is that if you made your fort out of brick, stone, earthwork, whatever, these are not substances that are well known for catching fire, so you can afford to have a furnace or a forge or something of that nature to fire heated shot back. And of course, heated shot sets fire to very burnable wooden warships, which is a, a, a fairly big deterrent. And also, as you said, it's the case of if you're a sail warship, the weather might allow you to get into range of the fort. And yes, you might win and you might not win. Accuracy is not really a strong point um, in long range cannon bombardments in that period. Um, but if things start to go badly for you, you may well find you can't actually get out of there. And a warship is an incredibly expensive piece of technology. It's often said that an age of sail ship of the line is possibly the single most technologically advanced uh, thing manufactured by mankind up to that point. And you really don't want to end up losing something like that to, uh, say, a 20-gun fortress just because they happen to get some lucky heated shot in on you and you were unlucky enough not to hit anything vital in return. A heated shot, I, I actually never came across this. So how, how hard was to do this? I mean, was it just you put um, a cannonball into a furnace and then you put it in your gun or? Yeah, pretty much. Um, it was, Obviously, you had the issues of if you heat up a big, solid iron ball, it will expand, which makes fitting it into the gun possibly a bit interesting um but i in a sort of a subtle irony this is where the uh lack of industrialized quality control kind of comes into its own in the age of sail era because as opposed to the dreadnought era where it was well here's a gun with a 12 inch caliber and here's a shell which is 12 inches wide they fit almost completely snugly back then it was kind of it's it's a 
It takes a cannonball that weighs 32 pounds. We have no particular guarantee that cannonball is going to be perfectly spherical or that it's going to weigh exactly that much. So this is why you had a lot more wadding. Uh, if you've ever seen any of the sort of reenactments of, re of loading uh, naval cannon from that period, you always had a big wad of material either behind or around the cannonball because the bore of the cannon would be considerably more um, in absolute terms than the actual uh, the cannonball itself. So the heating and expansion of the cannonball actually wasn't too bad, too much of a problem. Um, you did have to make sure there was a dampened wadding in there, though, because otherwise you ran the risk of setting off the charge in the gun yeah. through the heat of the, of the cannonball before you actually wanted to fire, which uh, is an easy way to lose a limb if you're still ramming it down. Yeah, I remember because I, I did a bit on this uh, ages ago and, and they noted that they cleaned out every time, I think, the cannon from, from smoothering parts that there's no premature shot shot going off if they fill in the powder again, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously there is also the, the other issue of if you've heated a, an, a big lump of iron up to several hundred degrees, you... there, there are some complications trying to carry that safely yeah. from the furnace to the gun. <laughs> uh, human hands are not designed for this. So, so was this was this common, or was this only in special ways used? This this, this heated shot. Um, a lot of it was in the in the biggest fortifications where you were kind of like, like say, I don't know, somewhere like uh, Copenhagen, which is an incredibly important city to the Dutch, uh, to so the Danish, sorry, then those kind of fortifications which are there to protect the city they're always going to be needed in those kind of facilities you would have heated shot kind of almost as a matter of course in smaller fortifications it would sometimes it would be dictated that they should but whether or not they did was often down to the local commander and whether or not a he knew how to safely do it and b whether he could be bothered um there was a lot more variation back then yeah very interesting heated shot so then I think we should move to, to the steamship era mm -hmm. because then, well, we don't, we are not reliant on sail anymore. So yeah, this allowed basically ships to easier engage coastal fortifications with, with the chance of getting away if the battle turned the other way. Did this yeah, increase I the situation of, of attacks and everything? Yeah, I mean, it, it it did to a a large degree because the deterrent value of coastal fortifications went down. There's also the, the issue of a coastal fortification, because it's fixed in place, is a known quantity, which means if you're planning to attack it, you can sit back and go, right, I know this fortification is made of this material, it's in this location, these are its fire lanes, these are the, the depths of the sea and the cup common currents and wind conditions in the area so i know every almost everything there is to know about what i'm attacking the enemy don't know what i'm coming after them with um so then if i'm if i'm the one who's planning to attack i can sort of go okay well maybe i don't want to attack from this angle i'll go from this angle um or maybe i'll build myself a new gun or a new ship or both to outrange them or to fire over a headland or something like like this which means that it, in a kind of protracted war, your coastal forts will be attacked by forces that are specifically geared to taking them down, whereas a coastal fortification by its nature obviously has to be just uh, a, a general thing. It, it's got to take on all comers, but um, it's always going to have weaknesses. And the Crimean War is an excellent example of this because it's right on that transition point between sail ships and steamships. And there's even a few ironclad floating batteries in there as well. And they find that the the sail ships take a lot more of a battering from the Russian fortifications in uh, in operations in the Black Sea than the steamships do, because the steamships will sail in, they'll position themselves exactly where they want to. They can even do a degree of station keeping and or sort of cruising in a circle or a figure of eight if they so choose the sail ships not so much and a number of sail ships have to be kind of rescued when the battering gets a bit too much by smaller steamships paddle tugs and the like um but it's it's also a good example of that whole issue that we were talking about before about the the difference in firepower because 
the Russian coastal batteries have maybe a couple of dozen guns each, if they're lucky. Any one of the big uh, sail or steam-powered ships of the line that show up is carrying 120, 130 guns or more. Um, obviously, they can only fire half of them at any one time, but that means a single ship of the line still outguns a fort. Um, and you can bet the British and French didn't show up with just one. <laughs> they came with with quite a few. Um, in, in the overall trade of fire, obviously, um, a ship of the line can sink, which is why some of them had to be pulled out of the line. But the fact that a fort is a fixed a fixed target, it's not going anywhere. Um, once once a ship of the line had found the range, it could just keep hitting the fort over and over and over and over. And the fort would just have to sit there and take the damage. Uh, and eventually it would end up being suppressed through either the magazine taking a hit or the walls collapsing or guns being knocked out or just the crew being demoralized. Um, because again, a, a ship of the line can just leave if the if the going gets too tough. It can make repairs, it can take a rest, it can rearm itself, whatever. A fort can't do that. And if you're inside uh, sort of a, a large coastal fort and you're just being pounded hour after hour after hour, possibly for days on end, it's not something that the human mind is set up to cope with, especially with the heavy percussion of impacts and your own guns firing. And so you do get a number of forts during that whole campaign, which are just either abandoned or surrender simply because the men cannot take it anymore. So, yeah, it's basically being under siege. I mean, there's, there's another interesting point that was brought up by an um, author about, about um, modern amphibious assault. And I think it, and to a certain degree it, it brings you as well. He notes that an amphibious assault is actually extremely hard to do, but the irony is that most amphibious assaults were actually successful historically. And if you look back at it, they basically happen if there's already a huge naval and sometimes air supremacy, uh, superiority or sometimes even supremacy present. So in this way, coastal defenses, even before the Second World War or something, are usually only fighting when you're already on the losing side in the naval warfare aspect, right? Because, I mean... Um, or is this common that, for instance, forts fight with their own ships against an, an enemy fleet? I think this is rather uncommon, or I'm wrong here. Um, it's fairly uncommon that a fleet will fight with support of its own forts, because, as you say, basically, by the time the enemy gets to the forts, they're, at, they're literally at your gates, which means you're probably losing. Examples where that did happen, um, we did mention before Copenhagen, so the Battle of Copenhagen, where the Royal Navy under Nelson um, was there to capture or burn the, the Danish fleet. In that case, the Danish ships anchored underneath, uh, beneath the guns of their forts and used them to support their own efforts. Obviously, the, uh, the Battle of Manila Bay in the Spanish-American War, the Spanish in theory had support from their own fortifications, but because of where the Spanish Admiral had positioned his ships, not so much. Um, but obviously in that war, the Spanish were very much on the defensive uh, and the Americans were heading in to invade the Philippines. And in the case of the, uh, of the Battle of Copenhagen, obviously, again, the British were there for a very specific objective. They were very much the aggressors in that scenario. The flip side to it is that Although in neither of those cases did the coastal fortifications actually allow them to prevail, partly because of us, as we discussed, it's basically the fact of that it's a known quantity. So if you're going to risk something like an amphibious assault, you are going to guarantee that you come with overwhelming force. The flip side to that is that if you have no or inadequate coastal fortifications, it makes the enemy's job of operating off your coast and against you an awful lot easier. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the things that the Dutch are always very proud of, and rightly so to a degree, is um, the raid on the Medway, uh, where they basically just rolled up and nicked about half the Royal Navy, um, either stole or burned them, uh, including the flagship. And there was little to nothing that the British could do to stop them because the Medway wasn't properly fortified. Um, they'd relied on an anchor chain, which got cut, um, broken, 
and that was it. It's like one, once the Dutch ships were in, in amongst the British ships, what coastal fortification there was was wholly inadequate. And weirdly enough, in some ways, um, you can actually trace the loss of the British battle cruisers at Jutland back to inadequate coastal fortifications as well. Um, if you want me to go into a bit more detail on that, yeah, of course, because I'm completely confused now. <laughs> yeah, so basically. Uh, well, the, the, in World War One, the German naval strategy, as you probably know, was to try and draw out a portion of the Grand Fleet and annihilate it using the entire high seas fleet. And to do that, their first tactics were to raid up and down the English North Sea coast using the first scouting group, the German battle cruisers. When they came to attack, they found that at best there were a couple of little six inch field artillery pieces defending the various towns, which obviously against something like von der Tann or Seidlitz was almost worse than useless. Um, I, th I think that the, the most success any of those shore batteries ever sustained was they landed a couple of hits on the Blucher, which was obviously the smallest of the first scouting group's capital ships. But even then, it was a case of, well, yeah, you scratched the paint, you blew up a little bit of the superstructure, you haven't materially affected our ability to attack your towns in any way, shape or form. Because of that defensive inadequacy, um, that then forced the Admiralty to move the battle cruisers sat the British battle cruisers south from their where they had been anchored with the Grand Fleet at Scapa Flow, where they could perform regular gunnery practice. They were then forced to move south to be based in the Firth of Forth so that they could respond more quickly to German incursions, because at that point capital ships were the only way to deal with them because say the coastal fortification just wasn't there. And it was being confined in that much narrower anchorage uh, to a large extent led to the obsession amongst the battlecruiser fleet with rapidity of gunnery and therefore ultimately leading to the various uh, disabling of safety in box, um, anti-flash doors and stacking of cordite and shells in the turrets to facilitate faster fire because you could practice loading and unloading the guns in your narrow anchorage you couldn't practice accurate long-range fire so they kind of relied on the, almost a spray and pray method and of course that then came back to bite them at jutland because not only was their fire much less accurate than it should have been for the british battle cruisers but obviously then when the german battle cruisers hit them back their turrets tended to go up like Catherine wheels, at which point so did the rest of the ship. Whereas, sort of tracking all the way back, if there had been heavier coastal fortifications that had either deterred the Germans from trying at all, or at least inflicted some kind of significant damage on the raiding German forces, the pressure to draw the British battle cruisers down and base them in an area where they could intercept the German raids would have been a lot less. Therefore, the battle cruisers probably would have stayed with the Grand Fleet and the kind of obsession with fast rate of fire probably wouldn't have developed to the extent that it did so in a roundabout way you can kind of see where where i'm going with that in, in a roundabout way the lack of coastal fortification on the british north sea coast was one of the major factors that was ultimately responsible for the battle cruisers exploding at Jutland like they did oh that's very interesting so to a certain degree it was i mean uh... The the common narrative what I always heard is that the battle cruisers were just not well armed enough or well armored enough, but it was due to lack of uh, following the security or not not security um safety protocol. Safety. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you can you can look at the at the at the results of Jutland in in extreme detail because obviously there was a lot written about it at the end. But although the British battle cruisers, yes, admittedly they were. No, nowhere near as well armored as they should have been and the german battle cruisers were a lot better protected the, the interesting side to that was that at the same time the british ships had bigger guns which negated the german advantage in armor and the german ships had smaller guns um which therefore although the british had less armor their armor was just about effective on the on the later ships on the lion class and and thereafter i mean the invincible class they had no business, to be honest, being in a battle line. Um, they were never designed for that role. They shouldn't have been there. They were there because of, oh, big guns. We must have big guns in our in our battle cruiser force and uh, so forth. But yeah, the Invincible class, yes, they weren't properly armoured. 
but they were still hitting the turrets, um, the ones that went up. Whereas with the Queen Mary, it was a Lion class. Um, the main belt defenses, uh, it was a maximum of nine inch thick on the on the Lion, Princess Royal, and Queen Mary and Tiger. Those defenses weren't actually breached by 11 and 12 inch shell fire, even though they were hit a few times. Um, they were actually adequately defended. Where the problem was, was the turrets. Um, a turret hit... Um, obviously, you have something like, say, a Q turret on HMS Lion. It's hit, the charges in the turret go up. It's inevitably a thing that's going to happen uh, in that kind of engagement. Um, but what happened, the reason Lion didn't explode was because, uh, luckily for them, they managed to flood their magazine in time. But what happened with the other British battle cruisers was basically they'd take a hit to the turret, um, there'd be a flash of of ammunition and what should have happened would have been just whatever they had in the turret at the time would have gone up that may or may not have killed everyone in the turret um some german ships took similar hits to their turrets and some of some of the crews would survive but because there was so much extra ammunition that shouldn't have been there it meant that the turret effectively exploded with a lot more force than it should have done and then the safety interlocks that were designed to stop the flash and the explosion traveling down into the magazines had also largely either been disabled or removed, which meant that the this now much bigger explosion went straight down into the magazines, up went the charges, and that was it for the ship. Um, and to be honest, even if some of those safety interlocks and hatches were still in place, and, and we know that a lot of them weren't, but even if some of them had been, the sheer amount of explosive that had been stored in the turret above and beyond regulations meant that they probably would have failed anyway. And and so the ship, therefore, the ships went up in uh, colossal fireballs. So, as so often, it's several errors or several failures that lead to a cascading failure in this case. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, if that, the, that, that lack of following of regulation is ultimately what's responsible for the loss of the battle cruisers. And if that had come about for whatever reason, that's why they would have gone down. But at the same time, as I said, the, the, the main reason that they even adopted that approach in the first place was because of this confined anchorage, which leads back to the German raids on, on poorly defended ports. Um, the interesting sort of side note to that whole thing is the fact that when you look at HMS Tiger, at Jutland, it's a relatively new ship. It hasn't quite been inducted in this cult of rapidity of fire. Albeit, yes, its gunnery is terrible, but most of its safety procedures are still in place, and it comes through, even though it's got no, not really any, it hasn't got any thicker armor and only slightly better laid out than any of the other Lion class battle crews there. But it takes an absolute pounding. It takes over a Need, I think it was something around two dozen hits from German shells, most of which are quite heavy. It comes out of it still combat capable, um, so, which if its, if its main armor had been completely inadequate, that definitely wouldn't have happened. Um, but yeah, we're probably getting a little bit off, off topic. <laughs> coastal de coastal <laughs> defenses somehow onto Jutland anyway. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that was very important, very interesting, because I, I have to revise quite a lot what I know about Jutland. I never looked it into any detail. I know, okay, this happened. And, and the famous quote, what's wrong with our battle cruisers today? Yeah. But this this was an excellent piece for me because I, this is sometimes where, where the devil is in the detail and and because sometimes detail is just not important. Yeah. But in this case, it's, it seems very important. So, yeah, um, we were steamships, um, Jutland... Mm -hmm. Is there anything yeah. we still have before before the second war? What? Yeah, um, there's there's a few because I mean, when we go back to the Crimean War, what you see there is um, it, it's called a Dr. Andrew Lambert or Professor Andrew Lambert. I forget exactly what title he's got these days, um, but he's a noted British naval historian, and he calls the there's a second part to the Crimean campaign that's actually nothing to do with the Crimea or the Black Sea, um, but it's the British and French operations in the Baltic, because obviously Russia has fleets in the Baltic as well, uh, which are a lot closer to Britain and France, so they decided to have a crack at them at the same time. 
Uh, and he calls it sort of the great campaign that never was because uh, Russian defenses at places like St. Petersburg and Kronstadt at the time were, some of them were the latest and greatest that you could get. And as a direct response to wanting to take them out and the infrastructure beyond them, uh, the British manufactured a vast fleet of gunboats, um, or they call them, sometimes call them bomb vessels, which are effectively small small ships um, designed to mount heavy mortars mm. uh, because at the time a mortar could be made to have significantly longer range than a cannon and obviously with explosive shells starting to come in as well the idea was to build several hundred of them which actually did happen um, and the idea was that in the next campaign season the next year they were just going to descend on the Russian Baltic fortifications with swarms of these mortar firing shells or shell lobbing gunboats and smother them in explosive and solid shot. As it happened, peace was concluded in the winter after they'd built them all, but before they actually got to use them. Uh, but that's another example of because the fort is a fixed known quantity, um, specific counters were built against it. And that tended to inform uh, coastal fortification design sort of post Crimea into the the latter part of the 19th century uh, because forts then started to adopt mortars um, because a mortar solved most not all but most of the problems that coastal fortifications had with regards to keeping their guns intact because ultimately a cannon is well, it is a ballistic ballistic firing weapon, but it is, it, to me, most extents, it's a line of sight weapon. You have to actually be able to see the ship to shoot at it, which means you've got to have a hole in your fortification that the gun can fire out of, and that is a weak point. Um, and if someone hits the weak point, they're most likely going to knock out the gun as well. Um, whereas a mortar, because it fires in a proper ballistic arc, you can have as much uh, fortifications, earthworks, whatever, between your mortar and your target and very quickly that gets to a degree that you can't actually as the, as the attacking ship you can't shoot through that you could have an entire peninsula between you and a mortar and you're not going to blow away a, a major landscape feature with a, a 19th century guns so the switch went from direct fire to indirect fire to a certain degree yes the the the, the, the as i say it didn't solve all the problems because the the you still had to have spotting and observation stations to tell the mortar whether or not they were anywhere close to the target mortars have obviously a much longer time of flight so um their accuracy is less especially against a moving target yeah. and also because you're firing in that ballistic arc especially if you put a major lump of land or fortification between you and the ship there's also a minimum range so a ship that's facing an entirely mortar-armed fort could, in theory, just sail right up close and then it would be um, immune to incoming fire because they physically can't shoot them at that point, whereas a direct line of sight cannon could have done. Um, so you end up with nineteenth century, late 19th century forts ha tend to have a mixture of mortars and uh, more conventional artillery, specifically to try and address both of those issues. I'm a bit confused now, but but I think I look mostly to World War II. So mm -hmm. how would you describe um, World War II coastal artillery? In this co is is this direct fire or indirect fire? It's basically a mixture. By the time of World War II, um, you still have some um, old mortars, sort of twelve-inch mortars and stuff like that, which would be. They're sort of their turn of the century, early early World War Two era weapons. Um, but by the time you get to the Second World War, most coastal defenses have kind of reverted a bit because as you get into the latter half of the 19th century and then obviously into the Dreadnought era, guns start getting longer and longer and longer, which means they can in turn have a much longer range. Um, so if you look at sort of the caliber of a pre-dreadnought era gun, most of them are sort of maybe 25 to 35 caliber guns, um, which is the, the length of the barrel determined by the uh, diameter of the gun itself. By the time you're into World War II, you're into sort of 45, 50 plus caliber guns. And so with much longer range, 
um, and also improvements in elevation uh, technology, especially for land-based uh, fortifications where you don't have to cut through the armored deck of a battleship um, to dip the gun, uh, sort of dip the gun breech low enough. The guns have kind of become a bit dual purpose. Yeah. Um, so that they they can fire almost in pretty much the same uh, indirect ballistic style as uh, a mortar would do for long range fire and they can also be cranked right down for direct fire at, at close range which was not something that um the sort of the mid mid to late 19th century guns were generally capable of ah okay so yeah so in a, so in 19th century you're too limited yeah you basically have a mortar indirect fire or a direct fire weapon and then when technology goes on you basically get a dual purpose gun in case for uh, for direct and indirect fire not for because in dual purpose i usually think about anti aircraft yeah. and, yeah. and, and anti surface targets yeah ah it's tricky yeah it makes complete sense now yeah the baltic campaign with those gunboats the gunboats end up just rotting away because it's kind of it, it happens just before the rise of the the true ironclad and then suddenly the technological advancement that just runs away in the 19th century um it like the the gunboats become obsolete very quickly a few of them see service in literal gunboat diplomacy suppressing sort of much less technologically advanced countries um but generally speaking that kind of period of mortar mounted gunboats is very brief um then you get into the ironclad era and all of a sudden ships are now as durable if not more durable than fortifications assuming that they've got adequate um adequate armor the american civil war is probably actually the next the next biggest thing and actually one of the one of the largest uh campaigns against coastal fortifications um and you see exactly the same the same issue come about of um by this point you've got big shell firing guns so wooden warships are really a disadvantage so even though the union navy in the american civil war has a massive um superiority in numbers and to a certain degree in technology as well and definitely in industry for a long period in the early part of the uh of the american civil war the union navy can blockade confederate ports but they can't attack them ah. because the this is a it's it's a very narrow window in which coastal forts have a definite advantage against um naval ships because the union navy is still made up of wooden warships albeit with steam power but now the defenses are mounting big uh guns firing explosive shells and a fight between ships a fight between a fort and a ship firing solid shot is basically which one structurally fails first um a fight between a fort and a wooden warship that's firing shells is really only ever going to end one way unless the wooden ship gets incredibly lucky because uh, explosive shells are much much more capable of burning and blowing apart a wooden warship than they are um burning and blowing apart uh, earthwork reinforced um heavy fortifications yeah yeah it's it is i i can feel this literally yeah <laughs> when i imagine but, but, it. but then what you have then is you have uh, the rise of the coastal monitor and um, iron and the sort of coastal ironclads and river ironclads of the American Civil War, and after a bit of experimentation, things start to swing back the other way. You have um, ships like the Galena with minimal armor, and that turns out to be a horrible idea because that you have the confidence that you're armored, so you sail in close to get accurate fire, and then you find out that actually you're not actually really armored and you get lots of holes punched in you and uh, things go very badly but then as the union industry starts to crank out more and more heavy monitors with um various uh, grades of large gun all of a sudden the fort's effectiveness is markedly reduced they have to switch over from firing shells to firing solid shot uh, armor piercing shot which means that at any given time a wooden warship is now actually ironically becomes a bit more survivable because there's a more limited amount of explosive shell available and there's every chance that the guns might not be loaded with them immediately if they're thinking they're going to have to take on ironclads 
and uh, and so it, it swings back and forth a little bit whilst the union's experimenting. But once they've settled in on their heavy monitor designs, they've got ships like the USS New Ironsides as well, which is sort of a, a more slightly more conventional ironclad. Then they start to be able to take apart uh, fortifications a lot more effectively, and that pretty much holds true for most of the rest of the ironclad era. Um, so basically, on the guns, so you you ha you have initially the shells, and they are initially only um, HE rounds, so high explosive rounds, and then you yeah. develop armor piercing after the armor chips come up. Yeah, I mean, the, the the irony is, of course, that the solid shot was the default ammunition for cannon in the Age of Sail. They then moved on to shells as more effective against wooden warships. And then as wooden warships began to be replaced or supplemented by ironclads, they actually went back to solid shot, um, initially back in just lumps of spherical iron um, and steel, and then during the American Civil War period, the eighteen sixties into the, and then as the American Civil War finished, going on to the late eighteen sixties, early eighteen seventies, um, you started to see the first what we would recognise as naval shells. Um, but at this point, they are still just solid lumps of metal. Uh, they don't have any explosive charge in them. They're just designed to pu punch holes in things. Um, the development of the explosive armor-piercing shell is comes a bit later on than that. That's very interesting because um, the yesterday the Panzer Museum Monster uh, released a video and and they ordered a book about one of these battles from the from the Civil War where two monitors were ironclads were engaging each other and he mm. noted that in development of armor most people look at everything at, at nights and everything but usually at the the naval aspect is completely disregarded, but this is very interesting if you look at the development of the of the the cannons to the to the shells and then to finally bringing armor piercing. So basically, you have the development there likely that you have similar on land with with tanks later on. Yeah, and then obviously as you, as you get into the once you get past the American Civil War, although I don't know, not so very really past, but. At, during the latter stages of the American Civil War and then into the rest of the 19th century, you start to see coastal fortification become more than just guns in forts. You start to see uh, minefields, um, helpfully called torpedoes initially, um, but then you get the locomotive torpedo, which is what we would recognize today as a torpedo, a self-propelled explosive device, as well as the more regular mines. So for coastal fortification goes from just a fortification with guns to a fortification with guns and a defensive minefield, um, quite often being uh, wire controlled so that they could detonate mines at will. Um, I have a question here. I, I know that initially uh, um, naval mines were called torpedoes. Was this mm -hmm. because, and land mines were, were originally also called mines, and then they changed the, the mine in the water, called them also mines, and then the moving. The moving torpedo was called torpedo. Do you know how or why this changed the naming? Yeah. So on, on land, it was, it was on land. It was derived. It was, they were called mines because they were derived from the fact that originally, it was literally a mine, as in you dug a tunnel, yeah, like a coal mine, yeah. and, and yeah, sappers, and then you, the the development, quote unquote, was to stick a bunch of explosive at the end and light a fuse and run away very quickly. Um, at sea. They were started off being called torpedoes, um, largely because of their shape. Um, I mean, they had other other various names as well. Some sort of very interesting things, like they used to call them the infernal devices or or, or things like this. Um, but they were generally called torpedoes um, as the most common thing because uh, the, the the main inventor of what we would call mines in the early part of the 19th century. He was kind of inspired by the torpedo fish, which um, looks nothing like a sea mine, um, but is also known as an electric ray, uh, gives a powerful shock. So it was kind of like a play on words of like this thing under the water that would give a powerful shock to the enemy. Ah. Um, then later on, you had uh, the whitehead torpedo, the first self-propelled one, 
and he called it the locomotive torpedo or the fish torpedo um, to distinguish it from the static torpedo. Um, but that kind of stuck more to the self-propelled part and the uh, the rest, the sort of the stationary torpedo, if you will, just became known as a mine. Yeah. Um, because yeah, it was it was a static amount of explosive that was under the surface, so people started to see the commonality between landmines and what we would then call sea mines. Yeah, it's like introducing new new stuff. Like initially in computer games, every um, first person shooter was called a Doom clone because the mm. the genre of of first person shooter didn't was seen as such. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So um, yeah, so that was sort of the American Civil War. You see a lot of the it, the sort of the the gen the start of modern coastal defenses, and then going through the nineteenth century, there's a whole load of um, shore bombardments that take place against coastal forts. But to be honest, a lot of it is a lot of what happens after that is not really so useful in determining the overall effectiveness of coastal defenses because you have things like um, the bombardment of Alexandria in the eighteen eighties. Um, where you have uh, a, a squadron of Royal Navy ironclads that just go and shoot up the uh, defences of Alexandria because the the locals aren't aligning with the British colonial interests. So you have but, basically extreme asymmetric warfare at this point. Yeah, it's like yes, the ironclads completely demolish the the Egyptian forts, but what would you expect at that point it's it, egypt was not a technologically advanced yeah. country britain was the most technologically advanced country it wasn't really going to go any other way i mean it's the, drawing a lesson from that in any particular fashion is kind of like drawing a lesson from the first gulf war about the relative effectiveness of the uh, coalition armies it's uh <laughs> not not the highest quality of opponents really yeah it's a shooting gallery and and i mean it's like yeah desert storm the the u.s mm. army and coalition forces all trained up to fight the soviets and then attack um soviet equipment yeah. which is decades old yeah yeah so then you you sort of you move past that into what you would call the the, the pre-dreadnought era and in the pre-dreadnought era mines show up a lot more and uh, especially command detonated minefields um but coastal artillery actually has a bit of a weird a weird uh effectiveness at one point in the russia russo japanese war in 1904 1905 um although again in that war an awful lot of ships are sunk by mines so you could argue coastal fortification by mine is actually very effective um but port arthur which is where the Russian Pacific fleet is mostly based, has this rather wonderful quality of being a harbour surrounded by high hills. Hmm. And the Japanese decide that a frontal assault on the port is a stupid idea. So they take over, they land further up the peninsula, they take over the high ground above the harbour, and they then effectively build uh Coastal, coastal fortification batteries, except against a harbor as well as the fleet inside it. Oh, so they they, they bring up a bunch of heavy eleven inch guns. They mount them in the high ground, and then they start shelling the Russian fleet whilst it's still in harbor. Um, and 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 this this is kind of that that dual dual purpose advantage that we were talking about before, where with the modern guns, they're able to elevate their guns to ballistically drop shells down onto the Russian ships. Um, and there's a few that go in direct fire mode as well. But the Russian ships, um, with their guns in turrets, can't elevate their guns high enough to engage the Japanese uh, guns in return. And so, although there's been a couple of inconclusive battles where the Russians have had to fall back before the, the, the Japanese fleet, you now have land-based guns basically take apart most of the Russian Pacific fleet whilst it's still in harbour, uh, those that haven't already been sunk by mines, um, which is one of the direct causes for the sailing of the Russian 2nd Pacific Squadron from the Baltic, uh, which is its own sort of cavalcade of hilarity. Jesus, I didn't know that. I, I knew about Port Arthur, but I didn't know that they br mm. brought up guns there and shot the fleet in the harbour. 
Yeah, yeah. It's um, and then of course, kind of like with Pearl Harbor in World War Two, where the ships that were sunk but not completely destroyed could be salvaged. A number of the ships that were sunk in Port Arthur were salvaged and then would see service later on in uh, the Japanese fleet. So yeah, that that brings us on to that's I think that brings us on to World War One, <laughs> covered about half a century in a few minutes. Um, World War One. There's not a, we. I mean, we've already covered the whole a British North Sea coast and uh, the bombardments by the Germans and why those defences were completely inadequate. Um, the British, obviously, they. They don't really go after the German coast all that much, um, especially not with capital ships, because the Germans just put hundreds, of, if not thousands, of mines all over the, the southern North Sea. So it's not not worth it, not worth the risk. Um, but the the single biggest test of coastal fortifications is at the Dardanelles in the Gallipoli campaign. And that's actually a perfect example of both sides of coastal fortifications effectiveness because the first time the allies go up the dardanelles straits they completely suppress and destroy pretty much anything they come in contact with in terms of the ottoman uh, coastal fortification so even though it's a choke point and a very very narrow one at that the even obsolete pre-dreadnoughts that they send up there are able to completely overwhelm um the Ottoman co uh, coastal fort fortifications. And if they'd landed troops at that point, then their entire objective of forcing a way through to get a fleet off of uh, Istanbul in order to force the Ottomans out of the war probably could have been achieved. Um, but in that wonderful uh, World War I planning style, they'd got half the scheme ready and forgotten about the troops part of it. So they 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 had to kind of go away and like, well, it worked. Now can we have some troops to actually try this properly? Um, and by the time they came back with the Anzac Corps, um, the Ottomans, with the help of uh, the Germans, uh, German specialists sent from Germany, and also by that point, also um, German officers from the Goben and Breslau, which had reached... Uh, reached uh, the Ottoman Empire by then, had basically completely rebuilt and reinvigorated the coastal fortifications to a point, and laid loads of mines as well, um, to a point that although they weren't able to drive off the Allied pre-dreadnought battleship presence, they were able to stand up to it a lot more, and you ended up with the grinding uh, sort of bloodbath that was the Gallipoli campaign, because the pre-dreadnoughts couldn't dislodge the updated coastal fortifications enough for the troops to make headway, um, but at the same time, the coastal fortifications and the mines, although they inflicted quite a number of losses, weren't enough to drive off the Allied fleet entirely. Um, and what, a couple of times, sorry. What time span do we talk about that the Germans brought up the defences again? Um, pretty much over the winter. Um, I mean, the so the three inch, months. Yeah, I mean, most of the, most of the work, to be honest, was um, educating the gunners into not running away at the first sign of an explosion, um, but also updating some of the uh, some of the guns, um, getting more modern equipment in, repurposing the it all. I mean, yeah, because the, the Gallipoli campaign itself kicks off um, in 1915, so yeah, you're basically talking about over the winter of 1914. Um, that they're able to, to to reinvigorate everything. Admittedly, they are only, quote-unquote, having to bring the defences up to a stage that they can stand up against pre-dreadnoughts, and they have pretty much the best defensive position you could possibly ask for in terms of coastal fortifications, with the Dardanelles being such a long, narrow strait. Um, but they managed to accomplish it in in pretty sharp order and yeah it holds out the the allies do send occasionally a few heavier ships they send a couple of the invincible class battle cruisers over and at one point the hms queen elizabeth as well and their guns being more modern and in the queen elizabeth's case a lot larger do actually start to wreck significant portions of the coastal fortifications but there's not enough they're not there for long enough and uh they don't have enough guns on the individual ships to to turn the tide. So, um, if 
if they'd brought in, say, Fifth Battle Squadron, threw all the Queen Elizabeths in for a few months, then they probably could have forced the Dardanelles, just blown everything up because there was nothing they're capable of standing up to fuller shades of 15 inch armor piercing and high explosive. Um, but the Fifth Battle Squadron had more high seas fleet shaped concerns to worry about, <laughs> so they, they weren't available. So, if, if I got this correctly, the, the main issue was training discipline and the lack of minds. In the in when they were initially attacked, yeah, I mean they they had to as I said they had to add some more more modern guns and um, beef up the fortifications a bit as well. But the one thing the Ottoman Empire wasn't lacking was manpower. So under their direction, the defenses that were there were effectively shored up a little bit structurally, but in a large part just massive earthworks, um, which always remain a very good way of absorbing explosives hmm. interesting it's quite it sounds quite quite extreme and like in three months bringing up the the whole defenses again and then it it mainly works or way better than it did initially yeah yeah but say so it's it, it's one of those things of in that particular case they you i say you you had both you had both scenarios of the forts being a fixed known quantity and the allies being able to bring overwhelming force and then the allied assault forces then being the known quantity and the german and ottoman engineers being able to reconfigure their defenses specifically to deal with what they knew was coming yeah so it was basically a complete lack initially from the from the ottomans defending and then yeah yeah kind of makes mm. sense yeah so that that that's world war World War One, largely in a nutshell. There were lots of other coastal defences prepared, but not really a lot of action seen by them. Um, <clears throat> with perhaps the there's one improvised coastal defence that's probably worth mentioning, which is at the Battle of the Falkland Islands with uh, Admiral von Spee's squadron. Um, they the British before he shows up, they run the old pre-dreadnought battleship Canopus aground and effectively turn it into a temporary coastal fortification hidden behind some headland. Um, and that is what basically dictates the outcome of the Battle of the Falkland Islands, because um, when the German ships approach, they have spotters on the headland to uh, radio back the, or telegraph back the fall of shot, and the Canopus starts firing from a hidden position. The shells come over the headland, they start splashing down, and Admiral von Speig takes one look at it and goes, I have no idea where these 12-inch shell splashes are coming from, um, but I don't want to be anywhere near them because my armoured cruisers aren't designed to put up with these. And so then rather than sailing into attack, where he might have been able to catch um, the two British battle cruisers at anchor and actually inflict some serious damage on them, um, he's forced to withdraw. And then obviously the battle cruisers get up steam and, and that's, that's the end of that, that engagement. But yeah, that's that's an example of the deterrent value of them. But again, it's a case of those 12-inch guns were significantly more firepower than the 8.2-inch guns on the German ships, mm. um, and and that's that's tends to be the key thing. Where the fort significantly outguns the ship, it it has an obvious advantage. Where it's equal or the other way around, not so much. Yeah. So in this case, we have the the unknown the unknown aspect of the. Well, coastal defense, whereas usually yeah. it's a known quantity. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I think that pretty much brings us up to World War Two, because um, uh, there there wasn't a lot of action in between the war, um, other uh, other than uh, some places were more heavily fortified, um, particularly in the states with the opening of the Panama Canal. Um, they put a lot of a lot of um, defenses around around the Panama Canal because yeah it, that that was more of a case of the enemy wouldn't want them the Americans using it um so they knew it if it could be easily attacked it would be easily attacked and they started putting all sorts of uh, large caliber weaponry around it so when we look at the second world war and i mean most people probably think about coastal artillery they will think about the atlantic war and normandy yes. and everything so in general, how effective did turn out the German and also the Japanese 
coastal defense. I mean, there's also other places where it were more effective initially, like um, near Oslo, where the Blücher yeah. was sunk. So, yeah, I mean, as we covered in the uh, in the earlier parts of the video, um, a lot of it comes down to how much money were people willing to put into the coastal fortifications and what was the caliber of the fortifications relative to the uh, the caliber and durability of the ships that they were fighting against. So yeah, you've, you mentioned the the earliest experience was um, the the, the Hipper class Blucher versus uh, the otherwise obsolete um, Oscarborg fortress in uh, near Oslo. That's kind of a, almost a case in point of exactly how not to engage uh, coastal defences, because albeit that the guns were ostensibly obsolete, they were still 11-inch armour-piercing <laughs> guns, ironically enough, made by Krupp. Um, and that's not a gun that you put a heavy cruiser into close proximity of. I, as far as I can recall, the Germans thought that the fortress being obsolete was also not unmanned, which was why they let the ship get so close in the first place. But it, it then meant that once those guns opened up and started to score hits, uh, the Blucher was in serious trouble. And then, ironically enough, um, getting hit by whitehead torpedoes that were obsolete when the high seas fleet had been around. But hey, explosive is explosive, and at that kind of short range, it was a bit it was a a bit stuffed. But at the same time, that was a case of a surprise attack. Um, other Norwegian coastal fortifications, they did manage to damage one of the German Königsberg class cruisers, but in general, they were able to be suppressed where they were known, and obviously, um, Norway would eventually be invaded. And that actually brings up another issue with coastal fortifications: is that they can only defend so much space, and so in if a battery, particular gun battery, is especially difficult to get rid of, you can land troops elsewhere if you can find a landing space and go around them. Um, because if you if the guns are there to defend a city and you can take the city without going in through the main harbour, then that gun battery is pretty useless because it, it can fight, but it can only fight to do just for the purpose of killing more enemy troops. It's, it's already failed in its primary objective. So basically the problem was an intelligence failure on the German side. Yeah. Well, it doesn't particularly surprise me sometimes because German <laughs> intelligence is, is not was often not their strong suit besides from the cryptanalysis and crypt yeah. cryptography, yeah. Yeah, um, and I mean, you've, you've got other experiences um, on both sides of, of success. So um, the, the next major bit of coastal fortification that's engaged is the 15-inch the guns emplaced at Singapore when the Japanese invade. Um, and again, the, it's kind of the, almost a similar thing to the eventual fate of Norway in that the Japanese take one look at it and go, why would we possibly want to take our amphibious forces into range of five 15-inch guns? Um, because these guns are obviously still very much current lethal weaponry. They're not going to bring cruisers, destroyers, and amphibious assault ships into into play against them. So they invade from the north, and although some of the guns then are used against the uh, Japanese forces, they're primarily designed to uh, engage ships, so their their stock is mostly armor-piercing shells and uh, not high explosive. So they're not terribly effective against land, against uh, spread out infantry. So so basically, this this is a myth because I always read that they couldn't turn the guns due to um due to the the firing arc or something, but it was mainly an ammo problem or both. Yeah, I mean, some of the guns couldn't be turned because of where they were positioned. Um, and the guns you'd you'd expect if you had, I mean, it's like even a railway gun which is generally seen as the biggest kind of land-based artillery. Um, even a railway guns are generally sort of 8 to 10 inches. So 15-inch guns, you think, oh, wow, like five 15-inch guns, that's got to be able to have some ferocious effect on uh, invading troops. And armor-piercing shell, not so much. I mean, it's like if you were hit by a 15-inch yeah. armor-piercing shell, you were very, very dead. Um, but um, firing it at sort of 
a target where you're going to hit the ground, the shell would probably go 15, 20 feet, if not more, into the ground, yeah. then explode. There'd be a tiny little puff of dirt and uh, possibly a dead mole or two. <laughs> And uh, and that's it. So as far as as far as a lot of the Japanese were concerned, they weren't being fired on because where where was the sort of several hundred kilogram high explosive that they expected to be blowing them to pieces? And yeah, and so a, a lot of Japanese soldiers believed, and the, a lot of reports said, well, actually, these batteries never fired on us because yeah, I say where, where were the explosions? Where's the mass ca mass casualties? Um, but they, I mean, they they were there, but yeah, they 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 weren't designed they weren't designed or stocked to fight that kind of engagement and uh, so they weren't particularly effective especially because as i say the japanese just didn't show up with the ships that they were <laughs> that everyone was supposed to send against them yeah so that that's singapore the next would be wake island if i'm correct. yes yeah wake island and again wake island is a good example of um it's a, it's a good example of how to defend your uh, coastline because they keep the emplacements as concealed as possible which is one major thing because if your emplacements aren't concealed they obviously they can be shelled bombed strafed etc before you especially in world war ii once aircraft come into play um so they keep them concealed but also the japanese kind of help by sending in transports destroyers and the occasional very small light cruiser. Um, so although the Wake Island battery is five inch guns, they are quite successful at tying up the Japanese um, from uh, from being able to invade. They repulsed the, the, the Japanese invasion forces at first. And although obviously ultimately uh, they can't hold them off forever, um, that initial that initial counterattack serves quite a number of tactical and strategic purposes. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, obviously, some Japanese warships and transports are hit. Um, they manage to sink a destroyer, which is always a, a good thing. Um, but it also means that because the Japanese forces attacking Wake Island were delayed they were slowed slowed down they expected to take it a lot sooner it meant that in conjunction with a number of other successful coastal defenses it meant that the american forces would were still present for a lot longer and that allowed for various uh, radio interception efforts and in other intelligence gathering efforts to take place whilst american forces were still in the vicinity of japanese forces which would then go on to be quite decisive in a number of later engagements. Um, the Wake Island campaign is is just one of them. The one of the the other major one is uh, when the Japanese invade the Philippines. There is an example of what is pretty much as we were discussing earlier, sort of the, the, this whole cost issue. You have Fort Drum at the at the. Um, entrance to manila bay fort drum is an example of somebody actually going you know what we are actually going to spend as much if not more on fortifications as we would on an actual battleship and that is dictated almost entirely by the location because the philippines are way over the other side of the pacific as probably everyone's aware um for most of the interwar period the u.s navy is based on the u.s west coast so there's absolutely no way they can ever get reinforcements over to the Philippines faster than the Japanese could attack. And even once they move to Pearl Harbor, they're still much further away from uh, Manila, Manila Bay than the Japanese ever would be. And there's absolutely no question of basing the US fleet in the Philippines. Um, so that means they have to take a long, hard look at their defenses and go, hang on a minute we know we cannot bring our mobile heavy artillery in the form of battleships to bear soon enough. We have to have effectively a stationary battleship. And this is what Fort Drum is. There are a lot of people that call it the concrete battleship, and it is literally just a massive amount of concrete. It's got a full-on battleship style at the time American, so it's, cage, it's a cage mast with fire control equipment. It's got power generators. It's got 
casement mounted secondary batteries it's got a couple of twin 14 inch gun turrets um if you kind of squint and look at it a little bit oddly you you could be forgiven for thinking it might be some kind of especially weird late 19th century pre-dreadnought um and it proves incredibly durable the japanese come up against it and they cannot take it or destroy it no matter how hard they try um but again as with norway and as with um singapore fort drum eventually falls victim to the fact that it can only be in one place at one time and the japanese invade the philippines from not there um and end up taking manila by land at which point the fortress is guarding something that the enemy's already taken so the the american gun crews they spike their guns and eventually surrender but between that defense um and wake island it means say that it means the japanese schedule is pushed back quite significantly interesting did did fort drum sink any ships of the japanese navy offhand not that i can recall but in some ways that's more of a testament to its ridiculous uh durability and reputation in that the in that the uh japanese took one look at it and just went we ah, they didn't even try to, yeah it's like we want nothing to do with this um that they they did give it a, a bit of a go um they but it, they very quickly realized there was no way that they were going to successfully um take that thing out i mean they, they did shell it with artillery um quite a bit but it's a it's a massive lump of concrete and uh yeah the, the ships they could have brought in like say the nagato or something like that to actually engage it they they didn't want to risk risk it yeah um, understandably basically the next would be japanese and and german defense or is there anything in between i think coastal wise the next big thing pretty much is the atlantic war um i mean the japanese they take a little bit of a theme off of uh, the sheer resilience of uh, the American uh, fortifications, especially Fort Drum. But, and ironically enough, actually Fort Drum occupied by the Japanese, although it doesn't have its big guns anymore, is one of the last places in the Philippines to fall when the Americans counter invade. But they, the Japanese t suffer from the problem that when they are attacking, Fort Drum in part is so successful because the Japanese do not have everything at hand that they need to um to actually take out the fortification whereas when the americans come back um yeah with the sort of near infinite numbers of uh essex class carriers and battleships all over the place and everything else in between <laughs> yeah it's kind of like the japanese have various coastal fortifications they put up none of them last very long um partly because they don't have the, the guns themselves in general are tend to be more what in naval terms would be defined as cruiser grade weapons six inch guns eight inch guns things like that so they, they're not really much of a threat to battleships anyway who can just happily sail up and blast them but also the, the carriers just send in vast numbers of bombers and again it's that whole problem of it's a fixed target you only have to throw so many bombs at it especially using dive bombs before you'll hit it hit it and take it out the the atlantic wall is probably the one we want to come on to next except for there is one sort of side sort of side diversion from the atlantic wall which is the dover strait guns ah yes um, they now they're, they're a very funny little uh, set of guns because it's peri periodically the case with, where Britain and uh, the Nazi forces would shell each other across the Strait of Dover. Um, ah, yeah, I act. Yeah, I, I know a bit of. Oh, I know that the, the, I actually thought they were hit, not hitting. I mean, I knew that the Germans had guns that fired over there, but I didn't know that it was basically a counter battery firing each other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's again the these batteries show the best and the worst of. Um, uh, of coastal defenses because the of the cost issues of they're not built like miniature battleships it means they're much slower firing um although the guns there are apart from the uh the three 16 inch guns that they bring in 
which were designed for the H-39 battleships, um, all the other guns are le lesser calibre than the sort of 15-inch guns that you'd find on a Bismarck or something. But those guns are much, much slower firing than battleship guns uh, and heavy cruiser guns because sort of the power loading equipment and everything that you'd find on a warship isn't there. But then again, at the same time, it's an engagement that literally goes on for years. So the fact that your rate of fire is measured in rounds per hour or rounds per day is not so much of an issue. So basically they shot each other for years, but with not much difference. I assume during the channel dash they tried to suppress them or? Yeah, so um, the, the German batteries would take pot shots at various convoys. Um, that came through the Dover Straits, but not not with great success. During the Channel Dash itself, the British batteries um, do try and take out uh, the the German ships as they come through the Straits of Dover, but they run into the issue that because of the weather conditions, sort of fog and rain and stuff, they can't actually see the German ships, so they have to rely on radar set, and so they go for radar directed firing. The problem they have is that although the radar is um, advanced enough to give them a firing solution, it's not advanced enough to spot the fall of shot. It's ah, not advanced enough to pick up the shell splashes. Yeah. So it's kind of like they know what the radar says they should be doing, but they're not sure whether it's correct, and they have no way of telling. So um, they fire off a couple of hundred shots at the Scharnhorst, the Gneisenau, the Prince Eugen, and everybody else. But they're consistently hitting about a mile or two behind where the German ships are. Um, so there's an awful lot of churned up ocean and dead fish, but no actual effect on the, on the German ship, uh, guns themselves and the ships even. And then at the end of near the end of that uh, particular engagement, the German guns on the French side start firing at the British guns, and so they they kind of end up fighting, sort of shooting at each other, whilst everybody goes about their merry way in the Channel. <laughs> that looks like an interesting thing for a comic to be honest yeah oh yeah so um, yes thousands of shells were flung e e either way um in those in those uh engagements eventually again most of that battery is taken out uh, after the d-day landings although eventually um some of the british heavy guns do manage to take out one of the heavy german batteries um, there's a German battery of 11-inch guns that gets hit by uh, 14 and 15-inch gunfire from the British side, but uh, there's still the 16-inch guns, there's some 12-inch guns, and there's some old 210 millimeter of guns as well, sort of 8.2, 8.3 inch guns, that uh, are only ever silenced by um, Allied forces actually invading the area. Yeah, I mean, again, it's a case, in some ways, you could almost consider them a land-based version of the Tirpitz, um, in that, like, that ship managed to tie up so many Allied forces simply by existing in Norway. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, the, uh, the mere existence of the German guns meant that the British, uh, certainly Churchill, felt res re compelled to respond, and uh, they put... Uh, couple of 14 inch guns and a couple of 15 inch guns which obviously could have been used elsewhere they put them into into counter battery operations so again it's a case of tying up enemy resources just as much as actually hitting anything yeah what what was the was the amount of effort comparable with, with against the tirpitz no um no no it's uh, well because the thing is once once you both sides have their big guns in place it's kind of a just to kind of well Slug lob first, shells yeah. together, yeah, and and hope at some point we hit something. Um, the Germans had slight slight upper hand in that respect, in that you had Dover and the associated towns, which were in range of them, whereas there wasn't really um, a kind of a, a comparable target town or city sized target that the British could shoot at. So the German guns kind of split their attention between shooting up the town. Um, shooting at coastal convoys and things like that, as well as the British guns, whereas the British guns basically just had the German guns to try and shoot at. So let's move to Normandy. And here mm. I actually have in front of me a, a, a document from the 8th of April 1944, 
from the high command of the German army and they know about um, that they know from landings in the Pacific about the Americans that all their landings um, have strongest air support and additionally artillery and rocket fire from battleships and as such they, they note also they note that a lot of smoke will be used so that the guns should be able to fire even if everything is on uh, is smoked up yeah and uh so that that would have been a, a mixture of remote spotters kind of like what we, what the canopus did in world war one so you would have had spotters out away from the, the guns to be able to re report the fall of shot probably by radio at that point um or possibly by landline as well when so the spotters are out of the smoke and also um i suspect they would have also looked into radar guidance or at least radar range finding um because yeah the smokes is two is 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 a twofold thing one of which is that obviously it the allies would try and use it to obscure the ships and but also the germans were very capable when it came to using smoke to conceal their own positions um obviously they used it to conceal their own ships that's why one of the reasons why turpits lasted so long um in norway but also if you if you can fire your guns through a smoke screen it makes the enemy's job a lot harder to counter battery you and in that respect actually a hidden uh coastal battery hidden behind smoke actually has a an advantage over uh, a ship hidden in smoke because if you have radar you can still spot a ship that's hidden in smoke whereas if the ship has radar you can't spot the gun battery because it's just a another land feature ah yes and i guess, I guess the the radar wasn't good enough to spot yet the the shots in the air uh no no that's uh that's a, that's much later down the line so <clears throat> you, you'd basically be back to the old old world war one thing of well we saw a gun flash in that general vicinity maybe we'll try and fire somewhere in that area but then you have no idea whether you've hit long short left or left or right yeah yeah and i guess uh listening yeah no doesn't work neither in this case so so the thing is about dd we know that the allies lost very few ships at least besides the, the landing craft itself mm. so in general the atlantic wall was not particularly effective and why was it i mean i i never looked directly at the atlantic wall i did once how mm. um, a division is set up there to defend an, an area but about the whole coastal guns i only know basically a bit of the propaganda footage yeah so, so i mean one of the problems they had was uh sort of as we were discussing at the very first part of uh the sort of the building up the history of coastal defenses was the fact that there were multiple landing sites across normandy um some of the heaviest guns were already at the calais battery firing across the dover straits and so they could have various smaller uh batteries all along the normandy coast and so forth but because they could never guarantee where the allies were going to land they couldn't concentrate large numbers of guns in any one place so when the allies did show up um they could only be engaged by a small portion of the atlantic wall which obviously didn't help very much the the guns that were there um some of them were fairly heavy um but again there there was a mixture of uh, weapons that had old sort of world war one vintage weapons uh that would have seen service on sort of old german armored cruisers things like that um they had a mix some interwar guns and they also had uh adopted a couple of uh pre-war french fortifications that had the biggest guns that were present in the area 13.4 inch guns nicked off of a french battleship but again it was kind of a case of overwhelming force the allies knew that these coastal batteries were there and again that keeps coming up that thing of if you know where your enemy's fortifications are and how big they are you can afford to dedicate overwhelming force to them so they they were attacked by air they were attacked by sea um the allies rolled up with multiple battleships of their own all obviously all with sort of 14 15 and 16 inch guns so you had you had a couple of the r class there you had a uh, war spike was there obviously on the american side you had texas there rodney spent a bit of time offshore as well um the nevada it's like the allies had more heavy guns present on their battleships than the atlantic wall batteries in that area had heavy guns in their own 
and obviously the allies could use aerial spotting because they had aerial superiority and such to to try and increase the accuracy of their guns but they they they, they were taken as a very serious threat um obviously once you have a battleship that's um engaging you your heavy battery has to respond to that because otherwise sooner or later you're going to get hit so you need to either drive them away or or hit them yourself so yeah it, it's so again it's one of those things of in as much as their objective of stopping the landings was concerned no they were not very effective in as far as their objective of forcing the en- uh, of a sort of, i guess a secondary objective of forcing the enemy to expend more resources than otherwise you could argue in that case they they were more effective because you had half a dozen battleships engaged purely in suppressing the Atlantic Wall guns. And then you think about the slaughter on Omaha Beach. How many of those troops might not have been machine gunned down if you had half a dozen battleships pouring fire into the machine gun pillboxes? Hmm, okay. Yeah, so, so basically driving away firepower from 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 the fleet towards the big guns instead of the, the minor defenses that actually turn up the infantry so mm. what, what happened with most of these batteries were they taken out were they suppressed or were they taken out by aerial assault or were they shot up by by the naval bombardment or were they mostly or was it like were they incapacitated by destroying the fire control directors or um it, it was a mixture some of them some of them were directly eventually counter-batteried by allied battleships um and then they were either disabled or destroyed in in that manner um a few of them were well a few of them were deliberately targeted for early early um removal by uh landing troops uh to varying degrees of success um and others were just inevitably overrun because some of these duels ended up going on between the battleships and the Atlantic wall gun. Some of those duels ended up going on for days. Oh. Um, and by the and by the time that was over, either they'd been knocked out or Allied troops had gotten off the beaches and were advancing on them. And it was a case of, well, okay, well, we can't stay here anymore. <laughs> you can't take the gun with you, so you just have to leave. So in, in some cases, you say the duels went on for days. In this case... Were there was there combat effectiveness in terms of 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 scoring hits so low, or did the the ships change out? What happened? Uh, the ships would cycle back and forth, um, which which and obviously they were moving targets. Um, because and again, it came back to this whole cost issue of uh, because they hadn't the, because the coastal batteries hadn't been built to the full expensive standards that they would have been if they had been full battleship turrets their rate of fire wasn't spectacular which obviously limited the number of chances they had to score hits and of course having incoming enemy battleship fire is somewhat distracting the they they did score a few hits um there was a 9.4 inch battery that uh, were engaged the texas and a, another american battleship Eventually, uh, they did get a couple of hits on the Texas, but the Texas scored multiple hits in return, which knocked the battery out. It was kind of this issue, again, of the level of firepower that was brought to bear, not just in terms of number of guns, but also in terms of the fact that you're talking about 14, 15, and 16-inch guns on the Allied side. And in that particular area, the biggest that you had available were those old 13.4-inch naval uh, French naval guns. Um, all the other guns were smaller, so their ability to damage the ship in return was less yeah. because their armor piercing capability wasn't as good, but also their range was less. So, um, to a certain extent, the Allied ships could, if they wanted to, stand off and engage beyond their range, but obviously they'd, they'd want to close in as close as they possibly could to ensure better accuracy. But it meant that you could have something like the War Spite or the Nevada or the Rodney engaging at what for them was point blank range, but what for the German battery might still be fairly long range. Um and therefore the flight the flight of the shells is different. Obviously if you're if you're using a sort of an eight or nine inch type gun, you might have be having to fire ballistically, which means sort of at high angle, which means that your your area of drop is very much smaller and therefore your level of accuracy is less. Whereas if you're if you're at the same range with those triple sixteen inch guns or twin fifteens, 
you're firing a lot more straight and level, which makes yeah. makes targeting easier in the first place, but also the fall of shot uh, zone is much larger, so the more chance for you to hit. Yeah, and then better spotters and everything. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it kind of makes sense. So, I mean, one German military historian referred generally to the to the artillery that the Germans had in Normandy and everywhere on the Atlantic, well, basically to a to an European artillery museum because they had everything yeah. there. And so, yeah, they had they had such a large area to cover. They were it was literally what can we possibly spare dash steal from somewhere because <laughs> um, yeah. anything is better than nothing. So basically with the Atlantic Wall we basically have a, a counter invasion defense that tries to cover nearly everything in comparison to previously where you usually defended in the earlier centuries only very small limited spots like important point a port or a choke point. Yeah and the Atlantic Wall in, a, in some ways it avoids the it manages to avoid the the problem that resulted that you had with places like Fort Drum and Singapore and Oscarborg, where they could just be circumvented. You couldn't circumvent the Atlantic Wall because of it was a wall, <laughs> for, for, be, for be, lack of a better term. But that then led to its own problems, as we talked about earlier, of the fact that you because it was so long, you couldn't concentrate. You couldn't be strong in any one place you had to be medium to weak everywhere um so it, it forced the allies to deal with them but at the same time also resulted in the batteries being weak enough to actually deal with um because i suspect if you'd gone back gone back in time to a year and a half or two years beforehand and and told the germans in no uncertain terms of where the allied landing was going were going to go and assuming the allies then don't change their minds as a result and they managed to concentrate all the guns in the Atlantic Wall into those five beaches off of the Nor on the Normandy coast, it might have been a different story. So so in, in, in a way the, the Atlantic Wall was not necessarily a paper tiger, but it was just they couldn't be everywhere. Yeah, I mean the the Atlantic Wall it could have held off an amphibious assault from anyone but the combined naval power of Britain and America. It was just unfortunate for them that the only people who were coming after them were the combined naval firepower of Britain and America. Um, I mean, if, if for some in some bizarre world we'd somehow teleported Japan into the Atlantic and got them to fight fight the the Germans. I don't think realistically short of short of bringing Yamato and Musashi into range of coastal U-boats, I don't think there's any way the Japanese would ever have broken through the Atlantic Wall, um, certainly not given their performance on Wake Island and in the Philippines, but it is what it is. It's very interesting because, because it, um, the Atlantic Wall quite often, I it's, it's basically that the people write, yeah, it was basically a propaganda thing and not particularly strong and it was showed and your perspective is like okay it was not as formidable of course but it was also not like okay just like a paper tire yeah no it definitely wasn't a paper tire it required a massive dedication of allied resources to counter it they had the resources to counter it but the fact is that that's cost in men and material that they wouldn't otherwise have had to have done and ultimately it's a case of realistically speaking against that kind of invasion there's not really anything that you could realistically do as nazi germany to form an unbreakable defense yeah. because the allies can just bring more firepower to bear than you can possibly install um so i guess you could argue from that perspective any defense is pointless because it's never going to succeed but at the same time you don't you you if you're trying to win a war you don't win a war by giving up um and if you can you do the best you can and uh, yeah maybe there, there could have been better ways of defending um the atlantic wall with but that would have required better intelligence so with what they had the atlantic wall was probably about as best yeah. as you could have expected them to do um just that it wasn't enough yeah. but just because it wasn't enough doesn't mean that it was completely ineffective i mean one one major problem was the lack of of air superiority or even proper air cover because 
you could say, okay, you go for a more dynamic defense that you bring in your panzer divisions. You have behind the the, the staging area, you have some staging areas there. But the thing is, they couldn't particularly move during the day. So you need to rely on static defenses to a large degree. Yeah, yeah, and it's and yeah, and it's this sort of it's it's always the case of um, it's it's very easy to look in hindsight and say, oh well, clearly this was never going to work. Um, but at the time, it's going to be less clear. Yeah. And and as I say, it's like, especially when you consider that um, by the time you're looking at 1944, Germany was, at least some parts of German high command were seriously looking at some kind of negotiated settlement. Yeah. It's It makes an awful lot more sense when you're looking at it in that perspective of how can we make the enemy bleed enough that they would rather come to a settled peace than a than a kind of treaty of versailles type situation um, which they wanted to avoid yeah i mean this is the point that everyone was running out of manpower mm. the, the 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 i think churchill basically noted okay we can do the normandy invasions but then we have to rely on the americans for the for the majority of manpower and even the soviets at some points had problems with manpower so yeah yeah war, war is generally generally with industrialized nations is not is not one like it was in ancient times where you march into the enemy's capital and behead their their ruler it's more a case of which one of you runs out of energy first yeah um and yeah if if you're on the defensive you have a defensive advantage so a in theory a lesser power militarily can force a, a larger power to the table if they can make it hurt enough yeah, because, uh, because the attacker must deliver a knockout blow, whereas the defender just needs to stay on his foot. Yeah, and I mean, that. to be honest, that's kind of, in a way, almost encapsulates almost, almost, not all, obviously you've got things like uh, strategic control areas like Gibraltar, but almost all coastal fortifications can be summed up in that way. It's like, yes, we know that the enemy can probably overwhelm us if they really want to, but can we make them bleed enough that they don't want to try? Yeah. It's, the, it's, that, it's that deterrent, the deterrent effect. Um, and the effectiveness of that varies, obviously, throughout time, as we've seen. And even within a, within a single war like World War II, it, it, the effectiveness of coastal artillery varies greatly depending on who you're fighting and what you've got to hand. But there's, there's always a justification for it. Uh, certainly at that kind of time period and of course there's the the great unanswered question of the the massive 14 and 16 inch gun batteries that the americans installed around the panama canal which were never tested um but were obviously designed for a knockdown drag out fight and it's uh, i think this the, the whole coastal thing is uh coastal batteries and coastal fences yeah I can really see more. It's more on the naval strategy and naval thinking side than on the the land warfare aspect, which is land warfare is generally I would say faster and uh, focused. Yeah, on 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 another aspect where the naval, as I always say, naval strategy is build strategy and a lot more focus on deterrent and and also cost in a in a different sense than land warfare. I can't yeah. put my finger down right now, but yeah, this is yeah. This is... And I mean, it, it also depend, depends on the nation as well, because if you're if you're a large continental nation like America or Russia or Germany or France, coastal defense is only ever going to be a part of what your 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 overall strategic needs are, because. Even if you had no coastal defences at all, or all your coastal defences were overwhelmed, at least in this reality, ships can't go onto land. Yeah. Um, so you could be blockaded, and like France was during the Napoleonic period, but that's about as far as the enemy can go. Um, yes, the, they can land an army on your soil, but at that point it becomes a land engagement, as you, as you mentioned, and then a land strategy is a completely different thing. Yeah. Um, whereas, so basically, you're using your coastal batteries, its defenses to try and basically just preserve that coastline. And it's again, then it's more about your your military and commercial interests on the coast in ports and harbors. Whereas, if you're uh, a country like 
Britain, which relies on the sea, or even somewhere like Norway, which to a large degree is either affected by or or has a large percentage of its population near the sea, it suddenly becomes a whole lot more important. Um, which is ironic, actually, given that of all the various countries <laughs> that we've discussed, Britain is actually probably the single worst off for coastal defences of in its own on its own land. But then they they kind of just obviously took the approach of having as many ships as yeah. possible and just keeping them away in the first place. Not that that tended to work all the time. <laughs> we just throw ships at you. We don't need coastal defense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, come come. Yeah, if you, if you manage to sneak past our ships, uh, well, we can throw rocks at you and send you an angrily worded letter, and that's probably about it. <laughs> Is there anything to add? For not for, for World War Two, I think we've probably covered most of it. Um, the the only thing I can think of is just to sort of to wrap up the whole coastal artillery, coastal fortification thing. Since we did start back in the fourteen hundreds, um, was would be the uh, yeah sort of post World War Two. Once you've got uh, missiles, rockets, guided weaponry, and that that kind of thing, the the coastal artillery becomes weaker and weaker um it's because of that it's that whole again that fixed part of it um once you've got uh fast jets and and guided missiles and laser guided bombs and stuff like that it's far too easy to take them out um and so you start to, you see coastal artillery generally dies off very quickly after world war ii as these technologies um come into play uh, a few batteries are kept around um by various nations some of them aren't decommissioned until well after the cold war but they're always very much secondary uh defenses at that point um only a few a few nations mostly in scandinavia build new coastal defenses after world war ii that use guns and they rely massively on camouflage um extremely heavy armor and all sorts of new technology for rapid firing um because they get they've only got one or two places to defend modern day coastal fortification dash coastal artillery is mostly done these days by mobile surface to surface missile launchers so and and you, we we have we've seen that being used but again it, almost kind of like the torpedo boat uh, and the minefield i mean mines are still obviously in use but the like the torpedo boat at the beginning of the 20th century these days the the fast missile boat supplements the the little road mounted surface surface missile launcher in the coastal fortification role but again we're back to that same old thing of uh, cost cost versus durability in in the face of uh, what's most likely going to be overwhelming naval and now air su uh, superiority. Yeah, uh, I think there's not much to add here. Thank you very much for this great podcast. Thank you, Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to uh, talk talk to you. Having having watched your channel for a very long time, uh, it's uh, it's always fun to actually talk to the person behind behind the YouTube, as it were. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.